Stillness Flowing, The Life and Teachings of Ajahn Chah by Ajahn Jayasaro, narrated by Gosaka. Chapter 2 A Life Inspired 1918 to 1954 Part 4 New Directions Return to Isan In the hot season of 1952, Lung Po made his way to Ubon once more. He had been away for two years, and his arrival in Banko caused a stir in the small village. In the evenings, he gave Dhamma talks of a power and persuasion that had never been heard before. This was a fresh, vital Buddhism, relevant to the villagers' daily lives, expressed in language they could all understand. And yet it would be going too far to suggest his visit provoked revolutionary changes in the community's spiritual life. The number of people that did not go to listen to him was probably larger than that of those that did. Indeed, some members of his own family were completely indifferent and remained so for many years afterwards. Everywhere in the world, it seems, old perceptions die hard. A common response, and one against which Lung Po would, in the future, wage a long struggle, was that what he said was true, but beyond the capacity of ordinary people to live by. Be that as it may, Lung Po had already sowed a number of seeds in his home village. There was now a group of people, led by his mother, who hoped that before too long, Lung Po would come back for good and establish a monastery in a forest not too far from Ban Go. Lung Po walked northwards. He had decided to return once more to Ban Ba Tao and spend the rains retreat, his 14th, at Tam Hin Tak, a mile or so outside the village. By now, a number of monks and novices were starting to gather around him, and he led them in an austere and vigorous regimen. Often, they would sit in meditation or practice walking meditation for the whole night. One time, Lung Po explained, presumably he had overheard some grumbling, that he wanted them to go beyond attachment to conventions of day and night, times to meditate and times to rest. If we stop creating any distinctions between day and night, we can forget about time altogether and put forth a constant effort. A sense of the warrior spirit that Luang Po was trying to instill in the monks is given by Venerable Tiang. Luang Po noticed me regularly drinking herbal medicine, and he asked me whether I'd been taking it for a long time, and I said yes, for a number of years. He asked me if the condition was getting better, and I said not really. He was silent for a moment, and then he said, You've been taking this medicine for a long time now, and it's still not cured you. Throw it away. Try a new kind of treatment. Eat little, sleep little, talk little, and do a lot of sitting and walking meditation. Give it a try. If it doesn't work, then just be prepared to die. Lung Po would stay on at Ban Ba Tao until the following rains retreat of 1953. That year, he left Ajahn Uwan, a disciple of Lung Pu Ginnery, in charge of the Sangha at Tham Hin Tag, and spent the three months alone in a small hut on a hill called Pu Goi, about three kilometers away. Every morning after arms round, Lung Po would take his meal with the community, and after ensuring that all was well, would return to his hermitage. The only exception to this was on the full moon and dark moon nights, when he would walk down to the monastery to participate in the formal recitation of the Patimokha and to offer his disciples some rousing instruction. The schedule that Luang Po established for the Sangha during this retreat was of an intimidating intensity. No rest was permitted during the night. The monks and novices were expected to practice sitting and walking meditation until dawn, when they would set off on an arms round of between three and six kilometers. The return walk from the village was a grueling slog on a completely empty stomach. 
with their big iron bowls heavy with sticky rice and after a sleepless night, they would sweat profusely under the weight of two thick robes. The daily meal would be some time after eight o'clock, and by the time they had distributed the food, eaten it, washed their bowls and cleaned up, it would be almost ten. On returning to their kutis, the monks would air their robes, practice walking meditation until weariness overcame them, and then, as mindfully as possible, collapse onto their rush mats for some well-earned rest. At three in the afternoon, a bell would be rung as a signal for the daily chores, sweeping along the paths and central area of the Wat, sweeping and wiping down the dummer hall and hauling water from the well. At six o'clock, the bell would be rung for evening chanting and another night's meditation would begin. For the first two months, the monks could sit and walk as they wished, but in the third month, the screw was turned even tighter. They were required to keep one posture, sitting or walking, for the whole night. Lung Po, orchestrating from afar, was practicing, if possible, even more vigorously. Illness the Teacher While staying alone on Pu Goi, Lung Po fell ill with an agonizing inflammation of the gums. Rather than seek medicine, he chose to endure the affliction. His previous experience of meditating through pain and illness in Ayutthaya had been so successful that he determined to try it again. In this case, the illness itself was not life-threatening. It provided an opportunity to work with physical pain. Like many seasoned meditators before him, Lung Po saw physical pain as an acid test of his ability to sustain clarity of mind in the most challenging of situations. A meditation practice that could not withstand physical discomfort was seriously flawed, one that could transcend it immensely powerful. Although it is true that the Buddha emphasized the value of good physical health and roundly criticized the excesses of the various deny-the-body-free-the-spirit religious groups of his time, it is also undeniable that generations of monastics have experienced significant progress in their practice through rising up to the challenge of illness. A prolonged period of physical discomfort firmly handcuffs meditators to the nitty-gritty, and much is to be learnt. Pain affords little room for self-deception. Dealing with illness and pain provides undeniable proof of how well meditators have developed their ability to protect the mind from anxiety, resentment, fear and depression when faced with the unpleasant. If fear of death is still lurking in the mind, it is exposed. Lung Po patiently accepted the pain. He alternated between using his powers of concentration to suppress it and with making the pain itself the object of his contemplations. With the mind steadied in a calm equanimity, he was able to investigate the inevitability of pain and disease to the human body and to penetrate its impermanent and impersonal nature. After seven days, Lung Po recovered. The pain in his gums had faded and was gone. For the welfare of many. At the end of the rain's retreat, Lung Po left his mountain hermitage and returned to Wat Tham Hintak. When the rains were over and the cold season had begun in its characteristic way, one night unannounced, with gusts of the north wind like a stranger pounding at the door, he asked the monks and novices to move out of their kutis and into the surrounding forest. Each person chose a solitary spot, put up his glot at the foot of a tree, and continued his practice alone. Once a week on observance day, Lung Po would give a dhamma talk to the group. In the words of one young monk, it felt like we were young plants, beginning to wilt, and his talk was a cool shower of rain. The monastic community continued practicing in this way until the end of February 1954, when Lung Po's mother, Mayor Pim, his elder brother, Po La, and a small deputation of villagers from Ban Go came to visit. They had heard the news that Lung Po had abandoned his wanderings and was now the leader of a community of monks. They came as representatives of the people of their village with a formal request. 
would he please, out of compassion, and for the welfare and happiness of them all, establish a forest monastery near Ban Go? Lung Po assented. Despite its harshness, the people of Isan retain a warm affection for their land, and wherever they go in search of work, and these days they may be found all over the world, they rarely forget their home. Filial piety and katanyu kataweti, a sense of gratitude for, and a wish to repay all that one has been freely given, are amongst the most treasured values of the Isan people. They draw people's minds back to their home village almost inexorably. In the meantime, they send monthly remittances to their parents and spouses, often a sizable percentage of their wage. Monks are not indifferent to such sentiments. Although forest monks may often lose contact with their families for many years in the early part of their monastic life, many eventually find themselves drawn back to their home district. A great many of the forest monasteries in Isan are situated outside the home village of the founding abbot, and in the nun section one can commonly find the abbot's mother and one or two of his sisters. Once monks are confident in their own practice and consider establishing a monastery, their thoughts inevitably turn to repaying the debt of gratitude they owe to their parents and to giving something back to the village in which they grew up. It may well be that the thought of going to live in the forest close to Bangor was already in Luang Por's mind. Certainly, the acceptance of his family's invitation was a prompt one. It was almost as if he had been waiting for it. And within a few days he was on the road. With the benefit of hindsight, the period at Tam Hin Dag appears as an interlude or, perhaps more accurately, a prelude. Lung Po was gaining experience training monks for the first time. He was experimenting with various kinds of group practice that he would go on to develop further at Wat Bapong. He was preaching marvelously to the villagers. Lung Po's readiness to accept this invitation surely indicates a feeling that he had achieved to some significant degree, the goal for which he left Wat Ban Go eight years before. Put simply, he was ready to return. After the excited lay people had set off on the long journey home, Luang Po called a meeting of the Sangha. It was decided that Venerable Tiang, Venerable Tong Di, and a few of the novices would stay on at Wat Tam Hin Tak, while the rest of the Sangha would accompany Luang Po. At the beginning of March, he started out on a final long walk, back to Ubon, and forward to a new chapter in his life.